In this video, I'm going to attempt to describe what the electrical unit of power, known as the watt, represents, and why we use this term rather than just voltage. Now, the first three of these devices you're looking at all run on 12 volts, but it wouldn't be fair just to say that they're all capable of running on the same amount of power. Let me see if I can explain this in simple terms. Now, even though this transformer in my hand puts out 12 volts, it's designed for the scanner, and if I was to hook it up to this light bulb or this motor, I guarantee it wouldn't be capable of operating either of these two devices here. And the reason for that is this transformer lacks another component of electrical power known as current or amperes. So when I use the term watts, it's a far more accurate way of describing how much power something uses in terms of voltage and current. None of these devices run on voltage alone, none of them run on current alone. They need voltage and current. So to describe, for example, how much wattage that this scanner uses, I'd simply multiply the current it uses times the voltage it uses. In this case, it's one-tenth of an amper. So I'd multiply that one-tenth of an amper times the 12 volts it uses, and that comes to 6 watts. This light bulb, on the other hand, because it draws 2 amps of current at 12 volts, I would say that it operates on 24 watts, since 2 times the 12 volts is 24 watts. Now, the amount of power the motor on my left uses, I'll just say it's 100 watts, although technically it actually varies depending on what kind of load it's got on it. For example, if I was to try to hold a shaft with my finger and slow it down, it would actually use more power. But just to simplify this explanation, I'm going to use 100 watts as my figure. And for example, if this motor used 10 volts at 10 amps, I would say it uses 100 watts because 10 volts times 10 amps equals 100 watts. On the other hand, this light bulb, uses only about one amp of current, so if it used 100 volts at one amp, we'd say this is also using 100 watts of power. There's one field of electrical work that it's very important that you understand the difference between a volt and an amp and a watt, and that's working with solar energy. For example, if you had a system you wanted to set up on a house and needed to know ahead of time how many solar panels you were going to need to be able to maintain the power requirements you have, you'd have to be able to do a conversion between voltage and amperage, and I'll explain a little bit about that here, and let's see if I can keep it simple for you. Now, I think it'd be fair to say that a majority of the people that are running on solar energy have a whole bank of batteries, solar panels, and also a device known as an inverter, which is capable of taking a low voltage DC source from the battery and converting it to a higher voltage alternating current to run different appliances in their home. The one on my hand, for example, you can hook it up to a 12-volt battery, and it'll give you 110 volts alternating current on the output side. Now, if I was going to attempt to run this 100-watt light bulb that requires about 110 volts AC at one amp, is there a way I can pre-calculate how much current or amperes are required from this battery to be able to do this conversion? There certainly is, and it's very simple, and I'll show you how to do it here. Now most inverters have a transformer inside of them which is capable of transforming a low voltage to a higher voltage. But in the process of converting a low voltage to a higher voltage, you lose something. And I'll explain a little bit about how that works here. Now transformers are very efficient at being able to transform one voltage to another. They can either raise the voltage or lower the voltage like I said, but they can also raise or lower the current. But in the process process of doing so, there's a loss that occurs. For example, if I have 10 volts going into this transformer on the primary side, I may get 100 volts on the output side, but what happens to my amperage or current? In this case, we've got one amp going into this transformer, but maybe only a tenth of an amp coming out. So, this is important to consider if you're sizing for a solar energy system. You need to understand what the losses are, so you can pre-calculate what size battery system you need and what, how many solar panels you need. Now if this transformer was 100% efficient, which it isn't, it would be fair to say that you have the same power going in here that you have coming out. For example, we've got 10 watts of power going on in on the input side because 10 volts times 1 amp is equal to 10 watts. On the other hand, on the output side, we've got 100 volts times 0 0.1 of an amp. That's still equal to 100 watts. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of losses that occur when you transfer energy from a lower state to a higher state, or vice versa. There are losses through poor coupling between the primary and the secondary side, and also losses through heat. 
and what they call eddy currents. So you need to calculate that in ahead of time if you're going to do a conversion from a DC source to an AC source. I'll give you a little example of how this might work. You might lose 10% of your energy just by going through this transformer. So the 10 watts that comes in this side turns out to be 9 watts on the output side, or maybe even 8 watts, depending on the efficiency of your transformer and or your inverter, because inverters have losses too. I think it's somewhere around 10 or 15%, depending on the inverter. Now a lot of the inverters made nowadays operate on a much higher voltage instead of the 12 volts. Some of them operate as high as, uh, I believe it's around 24 to 48 volts, and that generally means less loss. Now if I was going to run this 100 watt light bulb off of this inverter here, since we know it draws about 100 watts, and there are going to be some losses, I can pretty much calculate that the current required from this battery is going to have to be pretty high. In other words, this battery puts out 12 volts. So what times 12 is going to be equal to 100 watts? In this case, we'll say, uh, let me see, give me a second here. Well, I figure 8.4 amps will be just over 100 watts. So in other words, at 12, 12 times 8.4 amps going into this inverter, if it were 100% efficient, would give me about 100 watts on the output side of the inverter. Remember, you don't get something for nothing with any of this. You're always going to get less out than what goes in. You're never going to get more out. So you've got to factor in the losses. So even though this may require 8.4 amps of input current to the inverter, it's going to require perhaps an additional amper just to make up for some of the losses. I can't say exactly for sure, but this is something you need to factor in ahead of time. There's also going to be losses when you're charging your batteries. Batteries aren't going to charge at a 100% efficiency rate, so you might have another 10% loss there. I don't know exactly what it is, but there are losses that occur when you're transferring energy and when you're charging batteries as well. There are also losses that occur from the wiring going between the batteries and the inverter. That's why it's important that you use the right size wiring when you're doing a solar installation. One other advantage of using an inverter that requires a higher voltage input as it means you're going to be able to use a much thinner wire to power the inverter. In fact, what some people do when they have a solar installation, they'll put the inverter right next to the solar panels and they'll, then they're able to run a much thinner wire from the inverter to the house. If you're using one of these cheap inverters that requires a low voltage high current, it's not uncommon to see installations where people have to use real thick wire like this. So that's one reason it might be in your favor to use an inverter that operates on 48 volts versus 12 volts, depending on what you can afford and what kind of installation you have. On the other hand, sometimes these little inverters are convenient. Now, a problem I've run into with these lower-end converters is a lot of times the manufacturers misrepresent what they're actually capable of putting out. And For example, the one on the bottom here, it's supposed to be a 300-watt sine wave converter, and uh, I ran it on, I think it was about 150 watts of continuous use for two months, and it went, another one I had went bad. And I kind of figured it would because when I put my hand on the side, the thing was running so hot, there was no way I was going to leave it on a 300 watt output continuous use. So that's something you want to be leery of. It might be best to stick with the name brand if your life depends on it. On the other hand, sometimes these low end in inverters are so inexpensive, you might want to take a chance on one. Uh, for I think this particular one was about 150 bucks, and I figured, well, heck, if it's good for two months even, maybe that's good enough for some people. The other thing you want to consider, a lot of times there will be two ratings on an inverter. One will be uh, uh, the wattage output for continuous use, and then there will be another one for surge power, or in this case it's called a, they claim it's a thousand watt peak power. And that can be important if you're going to run devices that have a, uh, a high surge current requirement. For example, a, a big motor like this, for the first one second that you turn it on, it might draw ten times the current that it normally would in its normal use. So if you had an inverter that's not capable of the kind of surge required, requirements your equipment needs, that uh, could be a problem for you. And most of these low-end inverters put out uh, what you call a square wave rather than a sine wave. And there are a lot of appliances and devices that will run just fine on a square wave. But once in a while you'll run into something I was told you can actually damage, for example, a, um, 
what was it, laser printers can be damaged by square wave, and somebody mentioned that some of the Makita drill charger uh, chargers can be damaged if you're trying to charge them off of a square wave. So those are things you might want to consider. I was also told that sometimes transformers tend to run a little hotter when you're operating them on a square wave. So for what it's worth, that might be something you want to consider as well. Now this is a simple formula you'll often see in electronics books that explain how to calculate the power going into something. For example, if I wanted to figure out how much power was going into this inverter here, power in watts that is, I simply need to know what the current going in is and what the voltage going in is, and I simply multiply, in this case, the amperage times the voltage, and that will give me the power in watts going into an inverter. This can also be used for figuring out anything, the top power requirement of anything that uses electricity, not just the inverter. So the bottom line is whatever your power requirements are in watts on the output side of this inverter will have to be matched on the input side. Only you're going to have to vary the current going in. For example, if I need 100 watts on the output side, I'd have to have at least 8.4 amperes going into the input side because 8.4 times 12 volts which is my battery voltage, is going to equal just over 100 watts. Or, for example, let's say I needed 150 watts on the output side, then I'd actually have to have 12.5 amps coming from the battery going into the inverter, because 12.5 times 12 volts equals 150 watts. Or let's just say I needed 200 watts on the output side. The in input current requirements on my inverter would be, in this case, 16.7 amperes, because 16.7 amperes times the 12 volts I'm using from my battery going in is equal to 200 watts. Actually, 200.4 if you want to be exact. That's what uh, you would need. And again, consider there are losses, so you have to make up for the losses. You're going to need slightly more than, uh, than you would need if it were 100% conversion, which it isn't. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.